all of this stuff, as you can see now, I hope you kind of get a sense of, like, geez, I've got to get a little more discriminating here. I've got to be a little more critical. But my argument is we should be more critical about it all, with no exceptions. Both the old religions and the new religions. Just like in any, watch carefully, in any mature discipline, it gets hypercritical. In an immature discipline, it does not. Look at sociology, they're not even clear about what theory to hold on to. Look at psychology, they're still having problems. But look at biology, it's unified with Darwinian theory of evolution, there's some debate. But look at biochemistry. Well, look at physics. How much debate is there about the law of gravity? There may be a debate about the four strong forces of the universe, strong and weak nuclear force, electromagnetism, and, and, and gravity. There may be some debate there. But we don't really debate too much about gravity. You know why? Somebody can take their keys and say, you don't believe it? See? And I would suggest that the more mature discipline there is, the more critical it becomes. Whereas it's very important for a new discipline to be phenomenological, to be wide open. And then later on, then you apply your, your criticism to it. Now, having said all of that, what I have noticed is that you, as scholars, as researchers, you're going to get yourself some because even if you claim to be neutral, value free as they might argue, you're not. Even if I can make an analogy, it's a bad extrapolation, and I don't like to use that kind of physics to explain religion, but let's try it. You're a very famous uh, a physicist named Werner Heisenberg. He was, of course, the one who was the architect to quantum mechanics, along with Max Born, Erin Schrodinger, De Broglie, and a couple other guys. And he came up with, in 1925-26, this principle of uncertainty relations, which simply means that when studying an electron, you cannot know its position and its momentum simultaneously. You can know one, but not the other. It's very famous. Lots of New Age people like Deepak Chopra like to use it to apply things. But essentially, the implication was this. The observer alters the observer. Better analogy, think you had a big, huge hand, a big thumb, and you had a very delicate one. And you wanted to see what's inside that watch. No matter what you did with that big thumb, you're going to alter the intricacies of that watch. You're not going to see the watch as if I can think of manual Kant, as it is. You're going to see the watch as your thumb mangles it. The analogy is, if at the subatomic level, we can't look in isolation at one electron, that's why Einstein made a famous remark, said God doesn't play dice with the universe, or to his biographer, eventual biographer, Abraham Case, he says, you mean to tell me if I don't look at the moon, it's not there? You mean to mean that my looking at the moon affects the moon? Applied some atomic material. And Abraham Pace and, and Niels Bohr said, yeah, that's exactly what's so weird, by the way, about quantum mechanics. Because at the subatomic level, there's like a cosmic cot that basically says the causal universe breaks down, and statistical theory, like quantum electrodynamics via Richard Feynman, is what's happening. Now let's extrapolate it. Remember, it's a bad analogy. But let's take it to what we're doing on the your very act of studying that religion, I guarantee you, changes that religion. Why? It changes its own perception. Because for the very first time they have a scholar from the outside looking in, they're going to look at their group differently, objectively. Think of what's happened to Christianity. Think of what happened when the protest movement developed. When Martin Luther all of a sudden, let's make a, a German translation of the Bible. He allowed everybody to read the Bible. That naturally allowed lots of different interpretations. But it also caused people to doubt the Word of God, which caused them to do biblical criticism, which caused the Jesus Seminar, which caused so many other permutations. Therefore, for us, we've got to keep that in mind. How are we going to influence the religion by study? Also, is it our duty as scholars, is it our duty to also be more honest about our own biases when we study religion? For instance, when I did my doctoral dissertation, which eventually got published in the book, and it's not a very good book, but it got published in the book. Uh, the very first thing I said was my biases. I said I was brought up Roman Catholic, I said I was a surfer. I like this guru named Chauncey, I went to India, I did this, I did this, and I said, you know, the people I'm going to offend the most are the believers of this particular group. And the reason you kind of want to do that is because it just sets up front. You say, hey, this is my biases, this is my society. We also got to be careful. That doesn't mean, however, that the information given by a biased source is necessarily tainted. 
This is how science works. Science works when you can extract the information from the tainted source. Let's imagine the teacher, the professor, or the writer is a complete jerk. But if the complete jerk still discovers plagiarism, you should be able to extrapolate from that and discover it for yourself. So it's really not a question of whether you're biased or tainted. It's just a question of whether or not the information is replicable, that is, reproducible, outside of its tainted source. And that's how science works. And that's exactly how I would argue religious studies should work. I think, before I even go on, is there any questions for confusion? I think about a raise up. I agree with you. Well, let's, let's put it differently. Let's put, let's put it differently. I, there's, a, there's a number of approaches, and I, I agree that it's fraught with difficulty. But let's just play out something really simple. Let's take, you guys have heard of Sakhi Sai Baba, right? He's the Indian guru, very famous, has kind of an afro. He's, uh, remember Gumby and Pokey? I don't know if you remember the Gumby and Pokey cartoons. Art Cloak, he's a disciple of Sakhi Sai Baba. Well, Sakhi Sai Baba claims to, many people claim that he's a divine astronaut, a god man, and he can produce miracles. And that's a claim that can be tested. If he claims he can do miracles, he produces a thing called Vibhuti, which is dried cow dung, but we won't get into that. And he produces it, it's, it's sacred ash, and he produces it out of his hand. Now, I raised the question. If he claims to do miracles, then it should be able to do it in a controlled circumstance in front of skeptics or magicians who know how to do sleight of hand. Well, of course, I got myself in trouble, and I said, if Sakya Sai Baba can really do this stuff, then why not pull a Nissan Sentra out of your ear? Right? Now, the question is, if you're making the claim, then I think you should be tested for it. And I don't see any reason why, when it comes to religion, if you do make a claim of miracle healing, then why shouldn't we inspect it? Now, if you don't make such claims, and you claim, I don't really know, and it's just faith, well, then fine. But if you know, you see, well, people on TV, they make these claims about miracles, they do this and do that. <coughs> Ken Wilber, you guys may have heard of him, he's a very famous guy, and he makes the argument that religion can, in fact, be studied critically. He's written a book called The Sociable God, and he's just come up with a book called One Taste. And what he argues is that if, in fact, there's a hierarchy to religion, he comes up with this kind of, kind of fun little schema, whether it's right or wrong, it's fun to use. He claims that, that there are evolutional growths, like the archaic stage, the typhonic stage, then he says the magical stage, then he says there's a mythic stage, then he says there's a rational stage. What he claims is that if religion should be, if anything, is supposed to be transrational. But the problem is, is that much of what passes for religion is indeed not transrational at all. It's pre-rational. Therefore, he says, if religion is making a claim that there's something beyond the rational mind, then it should embrace skepticism and doubt. It should be quite easy. Look, if you believe like Einstein's theory of relativity, Einstein should welcome the testing because the more you test it, the more certain the theory will be. I don't see why religion, when it claims transrational realms, why it should be scared of the rational mind. It should be the opposite. Indeed, it should welcome the rational mind. Therefore, Wilbur's come up with an idea. He claims that what's happened is, is that we've made a pre-trans, this is a good stuff to use at the cappuccino bar or at borders, a pre-trans <laughs> confusion where we have confused trans-rational modes of thought with pre-rational. So it goes in reverse. It goes both opposite. So he claims what? Jim Jones and Jonestown is different than the Dalai Lama in Tibetan Buddhism for one reason. The Dalai Lama will allow you to rip, shred, and lacerate his theology. Whereas Jim Jones, when you stood up and said, I don't want to drink the Kool-Aid, you had to drink it anyway, but you were forced. The rational mind says individuality, doubt. The mythic mind magic mind says that you confuse images and objects. Whereas Wilbur suggests that there really is something to do with religions, it should be transrational. So that's how he does it. Now I don't I agree with you, I do agree. With you. A lot of people don't like this. And I try to do this with the American kind of religion. People just don't want to go that way. I think you're going to try thing of this is about to be done. I mean on Sunday mornings do you ever watch the, like a lot of the uh, this is not so funny but I hope but I find myself screaming at the television watching a lot of these um, creatures selling hope, and it, it's fraudulent, you know, and I just, I think that we need some critical discourse. That's, 
that's where I'm coming from. Yeah. And you'll have a couple guys who later on will say unfollow it, which is good because the more voices, the better. Go. Um, are you familiar with uh, James Randy? Oh yeah, amazing man. He's a great guy. He's a guy. He does what you what you're talking about. That's right. That's right. He goes. He just debunks people. That's right. And he does a beautiful job of it yeah. because if they withstand Amazing Randy's kind of cynicism, then they should shine all the more. Right. You know, he's given up, I think, a million dollar prize if anybody can prove something. Right. Right. It's up to a million. It's up to a million. And he's a great magician, right? Yes. And then he says, if, you, if if these people can do something that cannot be duplicated by a magician, then it may be something transrational. Maybe belong to the religious sphere. I'd like to point out to my fellow classmates that if you were disabled as I am, the people that you scream at the, t at the TV screen, their disciples will actually come up to you and tell you that if you pray a certain way, that the demons will be driven out of you. So, you know, at least you don't have them coming up in your face. Trust me, it's really awful. <laughs> but now, let's full circle this stuff. Watch what, this is probably the reason I'm always in trouble. Okay, I, I'm always in trouble. I mean, I've got death threats, people hate my guts. That's okay, because you, you have to do it. But so in this case, let's remember we talked about this like genealogical disassociation. New religions like to disassociate themselves from their predecessors because they like to be novel, they like to be seen as new, as innovative. Now you'll notice, I didn't mention one group, but actually a group you're going to be studying in two weeks, I think it's two weeks. Uh, there's another offshoot of that group, but not precisely an offshoot. They won't say it's an offshoot. I will. It's a group called MSIA. If you're looking for syllabus, you're going to see a guy talking about the movement for spiritual better awareness. And if I'm not mistaken, if I don't mind saying it, I don't think he really wants to be talking to this class, right? No, which is fair enough. And so let me see if I can both criticize myself at the same term, because if I argue for skepticism, I should be also ripping the teachers as I do it. MSIA, called the Movement of Spiritual Inner Awareness, was founded by a man named John Roger Hinkins, otherwise known as J.R. Dallas. John Roger Hinkins used to be a high school teacher in Rosemead, California, an English teacher. In 1963, after a certain kind of kidney operation, he claims to have been visited. In the late 1960s, he began to associate with a number of New Age groups, in particular, Ekinkar. Ekinkar's newsletter says that he was a group convener for Rosemead, California. Other people claim he was a two-year member. He kind of poo-poo's that, but he does admit that he was associated with Ethnic Card. Let's go back to when I was 20 years old. I remember doing that term paper on Ethnic Card, trying to track all the sources down. I'm at an old defunct bookstore called Donald Potter in Japan. Canada. And I picked, remember, it's kind of cool books. And if you ever go to like the boat agent, you'll see. So I pick up this book by John Roger Hinkins called The Sound Card. I'm looking at it. God, this sounds like Ekinkar. You know, I'm trying to follow Ekinkar to Radhaswami or Ruhani Satsang, but now this stuff sounds like, like it's been plagiarized or copied or appropriated. From Ekinkar. So I write John Roger Higgins a letter, a long letter, saying, they want a term paper, I found out that you were associated with Ekinkar, etc. Now he's a nice guy, let's be real clear. He's smart, too. He writes me a very nice letter. And he says, come to my house at Mandalay Canyon and talk to me. I'll give you 15 minutes of my time, I'll explain my association with that. I go, I'm about 20, 21 years old. Now I gotta be careful about what I say. I know I'm gonna say a lot of things that are politically incorrect, but that's okay. So I go to his house, really nice house. You know, I'm kind of stoked, I'm gonna go see a guru. I'm doing my research at Ekinkar, and I go to his house, and I see a lot of young men, 22, 23, 24, 25, in short shorts, washing the car. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm naive. We're going back to 78. I did not know. Didn't know. So I walk up. I'm supposed to spend 15 minutes with John Roger. The minute he sees me, he goes, I'll give you six hours. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, my girlfriend at the time said, You're an idiot. You should have known. <laughs> and so we talked and we became really friendly for like five or six hours. Very nice to He supported my research on acting cars and the you know. I gotta be neutral, you know, I can't dump on Ekinkar, but I'm really fascinated, so tell me all the dirt you got, right? So we just talk, it was taken. 